Thompson may go. While they're going, if you'll take your Bibles and open up to Isaiah chapter 61. The Old Testament prophet book of Isaiah chapter 61. Beginning with verse 1. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prisons to those who are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our Lord, to comfort all who mourn, to preserve those who mourn in Zion, to give them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness that they might be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he might be glorified. I'm going to continue with my sermon series, Christmas, It's All About Jesus, today, for God so loved, for God so loved. Father, again, I thank you for this day. What a blessing it is to be in this house, to worship and to praise you, to declare your goodness and your glory, to see the faces that are here, and to know, Lord, that you are still in the process of changing us, transforming us, encouraging us, helping us, convicting us, and Father, even giving us discipline. So again, I just thank you so much for this day. In Jesus' most wonderful name, amen and amen. Earlier, the Holy Spirit spoke to us, uh, and I'm always amazed how God will confirm many times the sermon that He has placed on my heart for the whole week he will confirm it through the gifts of the Holy Spirit, through tongues and interpretation, or through prophecy. These are the words that I wrote, and then I'll come back to what God shared. I have felt such an urgency over the past few months to make sure everyone understands what is taking place and to be prepared for what is coming. Do you remember the first couple of words that the Holy Spirit spoke to us this morning? Be aware. Be aware, be alert, look at the seasons, see what's going on around you, understand the times that we live in. I went on in my writing, as we approach the end of time and the world comes to closer to judgment, we, the people of God, somebody shout amen, we, the people of God, must raise our voices like never before. Do you remember what the Holy Spirit spoke to us? The Holy Spirit said, be prepared to be salt and light in the world around you. What I have to share with you this morning is not a doomsday, doomsday message or is it gloomy. But I want you to understand and I want you to comprehend and I want every person here to know that although we live in the end times and we are living at a time, I believe, just before the rapture of the church, I believe in that. You may not be aware of this, but there's a teaching going on right now, even in the Assemblies of God, that there is no such thing as a rapture. That it's a new teaching that has no validity in Scripture. Let me just say for the record, I believe in the rapture of the church. I believe that the trumpet shall sound and the body of Christ will leave this planet, the ones that are ready and prepared. Can I get an amen? Don't be deceived by people that come around in the end times and talk heresy. Don't be deceived by those who will come around and tell you these things are not going to happen. I tell you they will happen. And why will they happen, Pastor? Because God's Word says so, if for no other reason. But I do believe that we are living in a day right before the end of time when we, the people of God, must be alert and aware of our surroundings and be prepared to give an answer. I'm amazed, I really am I'm amazed in Christendom, I'm amazed at what goes on in the name of Jesus Christ, of how we are to touch the world around us, and it seems so much to be so much humanistic approach that I'm even surprised anyone's listening at all. Let me just tell you right now, you want to see a world change? Let's see the miraculous supernatural hand of God move on hearts and lives. Let someone get saved. Let's get, let someone get delivered. Let someone get set free. Let the prison doors open. Someone shout amen. Let the sick get healed. Let those that are bound up in drugs and alcohol get delivered and set free. And watch and see if a world won't take notice. 
I believe this with all of my heart, mind, and soul, that we do more good for the body of Christ and, and more good for the world around us if we will lay hands on the sick and see them recover. If we'll see people saved and set free. I, I once heard a man say, if Jesus gave his life for my salvation, he wasted his time. We have people in our church right now who are suffering through persecution, end time persecution, just because they are Christ followers for no other reason. They've not been obnoxious. They've not been uh, trying to force their way on anybody else. They've not tried to proclaim that they're, the, that they're the only way necessarily. They've just said, I believe in Jesus. And because they believe in Jesus, they're being persecuted. Next Sunday, we will celebrate Christmas. And my friends, it no longer can be what it used to be. It can no longer be just going through the motions. It can no longer be just simply lip service. As long as there's a church that remains on this earth, there is still time and hope for those to hear the message that Jesus saves. There must be a sense of urgency in the body of Jesus Christ that says that Jesus Christ came to save the lost. And for all of those that love to get the presents and love to celebrate the, the holiday, so to speak, I am not trying to put a damper on your celebration. What I'm saying, though, is this. Let the name of Jesus be lifted high. Let His glory shine upon the earth. Christmas for the Christ follower, the, the Christmas for Christians, must no longer be just another holiday. The days ahead are just too dark. Who would agree? The days ahead are just too dark without the declaration that Jesus came to give His life and life abundantly. Who believes that Jesus came to give each and every one of us life and life abundantly? If you believe it, give the Lord a clap offering and praise in this house. But please understand what that means. Please. Christmas must be remembered for what it represents. That Jesus stepped out of eternity and into time. That he left heaven. Clothed himself with humanity. In order that mankind could be reconciled to God. The question is why? Why would Jesus do that? I simply give you John 3.16. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have eternal life. Just after Jesus started His public ministry, He went to Nazareth. And like it was His tradition to do, He went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and there He took the scroll of Isaiah. You know, it was tradition in the synagogue. It was tradition if a new minister showed up or someone new showed up, they always were given the opportunity to speak. Jesus goes to the synagogue there in Nazareth. They gave him the scroll. They just happened to give him the scroll of Isaiah. And he reads from Isaiah 61 where he proclaimed that the prophecy would be fulfilled in him that day. Who believes that Jesus is the way? Who believes he's the truth? Who believes he is our Lord and Savior? Who believes he is our all in all? How many of you believe he's the way today? So I just want to take a moment of your time, if I might, to this morning. To look at the reasons why Jesus came. Why did God love us so much? I think the first reason why he came was to preach good news. He came to preach good news. Jesus, anointed with the Holy Spirit, came to preach the gospel to a world that was morally bankrupt. You know, Listen, I know we live in these days. I know we live in these times. And times are dark and times are hard. Troublesome, dangerous even. I get all of that and understand that. But my friends, in Jesus' day, when he first came, the world was morally bankrupt as well. And dangerous. But he came to a world that was broken. And he spoke the good news to the world that needed to hear it. We also have been anointed with the Holy Spirit as part of Jesus' commission to us to go into all the world and preach the good news. My friends... I believe that it is so very important that we gather often as the body of Christ to receive the training, the teaching, the discipleship, and the encouragement we need. Listen, every person in this house, 
Every person that's listening to my voice online, if you listen to this sermon months from now, please understand this. We need all of God's people to gather in this place to give Him praise and worship, to get training, to get instruction, to feel the anointing of the Holy Spirit, to stand strong in the power of God so that you can go forward into the world and proclaim the good news. The primary reason, the primary reason why we are gathered in this house today is because we want to worship Him collectively. We want to hear anointed preaching. We want to experience the supernatural presence of God. We want to see our hearts filled with the Holy Spirit in our minds and hearts baptized in His Spirit in order that we might be the salt and light in a dark and dying place. As your pastor, it is my hope that when we leave this place, and we enter into our neighborhoods, our workplaces, the marketplace, our schools, our home, that we preach the good news of Jesus Christ. And when all else fails, open our mouth and say words. We must also have behavior and conduct that is such a way that it will turn the world upside down for Jesus does the world know who Jesus is by looking at your behavior and your attitude and the words that come out of your mouth and the things that you do? I have come across in my lifetime, I spent 30 years in the secular workplace before going into ministry full time. And I have heard at least a dozen people claim to be Christians Yet the words that came out of their mouth and their behavior and the things that they said and the things that they did did not match being a Christian. Who here believes that if we're going to call ourselves Christ followers, we should act Christ-like? Who agrees? So what is the good news, Pastor? What is it that I need to share with the world? 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4. That Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures. Write that portion of Scripture down. Take it and memorize it. And when someone asks you why you believe, give them that Scripture. Give them that Scripture. I also believe that Jesus came to bring healing. Anybody here believe that Jesus still heals? Now, now please, please listen to me very carefully. I'm going to call people up at the end of the service to pray for healing. I'm also going to bring people up at the end of the service to pray for salvation. But listen to me very carefully. We have too often give lip service to these things. And unfortunately, we've had some ministers over the years that have abused God's word. To the point where people don't believe that healing can take place anymore. I had a dear friend that, that I love very much. Who passed away recently. They said he was astonished at why there wasn't any healings going on in churches anymore. My friends, we cannot usurp the authority of God. It cannot be about me. Somebody shout amen. It cannot be about me. It cannot be about you. It has to be about all about Jesus Christ. Who believes Jesus still heals? Who believes we can lay hands on the sick and see them recover? Let us start releasing that faith today. And let's believe and trust in God and believe that He can heal. If you believe God can still heal, give Him a clap offering of praise in this house. Anointed by the Holy Spirit, Jesus came with a healing ministry. Early believers regularly and with anticipation brought their need of physical healing to prayer. Listen to, to, to James, Pastor James in chapter 5, verses 14 through 16. It says, Is anyone sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church. Let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the sick, and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed any sins, he will be forgiven. Confess your faults to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man accomplishes much. The early church believed in prayer and healing for their physical needs and believed that they were linked together and they could be regularly 
asked and expected to be a part of the Christian experience. In other words, when people gathered in the time of Christ, the church in the time of the apostles, when they gathered, they believed healing would take place each and every time. Our Lord is the creator of life and the recreator of life. When ministers visit our church, one of the things that they often tell me is they say, John, it's so refreshing to see that you still pray for the sick. Is there anyone here thankful that we still pray for the sick? If you're here this morning and we've prayed for you for a sickness and God has healed your body, raise a hand. I want to see. Glory, 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 glory. How many of you believe God still heals? Through the anointing of the Holy Spirit, we can be healed Jesus also came to provide freedom. Someone shout freedom. Anointed with the Holy Spirit, Jesus came to set captives free and to release prisoners from darkness. Listen, please hear me. L last week I shared that there are horrible addictions in our church. And I believe that we can call them addictions, but they can also be called strongholds or spiritual bondage. A stronghold is, biblically speaking, is anything that's got a hold of you that the devil has lied to you and said you'll never overcome. You'll never overcome it. You'll be a drug addict for the rest of your life. You'll be an alcoholic for the rest of your life. You'll never be able to overcome it. You'll be bound up in these things for the rest of your life. You'll never be able to overcome it. Those are spiritual strongholds. What are, what are we told to do with spiritual strongholds in the Bible? We're called to tear them down. Somebody shout amen. How do we do that, Pastor? You lay hands on people and pray that God set them free. There are all kinds of spiritual bondage in the world today. And there might be someone here this morning that's in this house right now and you're struggling with sinful lifestyle and it hinders your walk with Jesus. It keeps you from all that God wants to do in you and through you. Because you have this bondage in your heart, or you have this bondage in your mind, or you're bound up with things, a sinfulness that you just can't seem to overcome. Let me help you today. Jesus has come so that you can be an overcomer. I believe that Jesus knows who you are, and He understands, and He can set you free and lead you out of darkness right now. If you're listening to me online... Know this, that God can set you free from your bondage. I am burdened. I tell you, I am burdened this morning for those who are captive to sin and bondage. It's heartbreaking to see people in the body of Christ bound up in fear, depression, mental oppression, demonic oppression, and discouragement. I tell you right now, these are tools of the devil, and he uses them to keep God's people ineffective and unproductive. If we are going to be the body of Jesus Christ, if we're going to be productive in his, in his mind and heart for us, then we must get over fears. We must get over these things that hold us down, depression, mental oppression. We need to say to the Lord, Lord, set me free. I'm also burdened over the part of anger and bitterness and resentment and jealousy and pride that the devil uses to tear people apart. Listen, 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 please listen. In these days that we live, in these dark times, we have proclaimed that time is dark, the end is near, Jesus is coming soon. We understand and know that we live at a time where it's dangerous. Who believes that we need to get over pride? Who believes we need to get over resentfulness? Who believes we need to put bitterness in its place? Who believes we need to say, no more depression, but give me joy unspeakable and full of glory? Who believes it's time for the church of Jesus Christ to raise hands towards the sky and give Him praise and glory for who He is and not let the devil lie to us anymore? If you believe in that, that we should not let the devil lie to us anymore, give the Lord a clap offering of praise in this house today. Jesus has come to set you free. What are you holding on to? What are you holding on to that keeps you from a loving relationship with God the Father? How many of you know that you need to let it go and let God? Let it go and let God. Let God completely deliver you from your sin and for your shame. This is an important message this morning for someone. Someone needs to hear this message this morning. I, I can't tell you how often in my own life 
how resentfulness and bitterness and pride the devil has used to keep me down and to keep me under his thumb years ago, but still, I can't, can't begin to tell you. I am so glad the day that some brothers got me alone in a room someplace and laid hands on me and prayed and asked God to deliver me and set me free. Somebody shout amen. amen. Those days were deliverance. I, I, had a, I had a commander in the army that uh, just didn't like me, and I, I know that's hard to believe. But I had this commander in the army that just didn't like me, and he just would... He would always just give me the business. And one day, one day it was in Germany. We were, we were uh, over there. And one day he called me into his office and he just said that I was the sorriest excuse for anything. I left that office feeling pretty low. Then I got pretty angry. Who knows what I'm talking about? I was a believer. I was, Holland and I were attending church. We were good Christian people. But I left out of that room and anger started to get a hold of me. Before long, resentment started to take hold. Bitterness started to grab hold of me. I really, this, this commander didn't like me. I started to not like him either. Who hears what I'm saying? And these brothers got a hold of me and they said, you know, you need to forgive him. I go, oh man, do you know what you ask? You need to pray, get it under the blood, ask him to forgive you. I said, but he did me wrong. Doesn't matter. Your resentment and bitterness towards this man has caused you to fall in a place where you're no longer effective for the body of Jesus Christ or for God. You need to get right with Jesus. How many of you know that some of us need to get right with Jesus? So I made an appointment to go see my commander. I went in to see him. The sergeant major was there. And I went in and I said, Sir, I'm just here to ask for your forgiveness because I've copped an attitude towards you personally. And I just want you to know that I'm sorry. Would you please forgive me? And the man looked at me and said, get out. True story. But when I left the room, guess what? I was completely delivered. Somebody shout amen. Completely delivered. I no longer had resentment or bitterness in my heart. I had a song in my heart. And I knew that Jesus was my Lord and Savior. And I didn't particularly care whether this guy liked me or not. Jesus loves me. Ooh, glory. That preaches, doesn't it? Man, so-and-so may not like you, but Jesus loves you. How many of you believe He wants to set you free today? He wants to set you free. Jesus also came to exchange. To give them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. That they might be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that He might be glorified. It was common in ancient times to lay in an ash heap when mourning. You, you, you laid in an ash heap and you tore your clothes and you threw ash on your head. It, it was to signify that you were mourning, that you were in despair. And Jesus came not only to bring comfort in times of mourning, but to exchange our mourning with beauty, to give us a holy cheerfulness. Now, please understand, I understand there's a time for mourning. Who believes there's a time to mourn? Who believes there's a time to be sorry? There's a time that our hearts should grieve. There's a time when we need to express what we're going through. But we can't stay in that for very long. Because if you stay in that for very long, it brings depression. We have to get to a place where we understand that even though I can mourn, Jesus will give me joy in the morning. Anybody here want to exchange your grief for holiness and happiness and joy? Jesus has come so that we can trade our sorrow for joy. He will give us the oil of joy to make our faces shine with His glory. <laughs> come on. He will exchange our spirit of heaviness for the garment of praise. I shared with you last week that uh, one of our dear friends in Oakville, uh, Solveig Bueller, passed away not long ago. What a beautiful lady. She was 93 years old. She had served the same community since she was just a young woman, Oakville. I used to have people that would call me on the phone or they'd call me and they would be fussing. And I would mention the name of the Buellers and their whole tone would change and soften. And they would say, oh, what precious people. 
Sister Bueller, so big, Bueller and her husband, Mel, pastored that church down there for 38 years. Can you imagine? And then still stayed when new pastors came. Sister Bueller drove the school bus for a while and always was available to anybody that needed her. I, don't, I can't tell you how many times I saw her when it should have been a space of sadness. She would look at me and smile. Do you remember her smile, sweet? She would look at me and smile. And the joy of the Lord would shine in her heart. And yet her life was not perfect. How many of you believe you have to have a perfect life to have the joy of the Lord in your heart? Well, if you're waiting for perfection, you've got a long wait. But how many of you are ready to trade in mourning for the joy of the Lord? How many of you are ready to put those things under the blood of the Lamb and say, Lord, come and touch my heart and make me whole? Yes, there's a time for mourning, but there's also a time for joyfulness and for praise and worship. In fact, I would just, I would just suggest to you that if you really want to get rid of mourning, if you really want to get rid of sadness, break out praise. Say, Pastor, I can't sing well. I didn't say sing well. I said break out praise. I didn't say that you could sing or carry a note. I said make a joyful noise. Somebody shout amen. That was another thing about Sister Beulah that we love so much. She would break out in song, I'm going to tell you, and she would sing. She couldn't sing well, but she could sing. Someone shout amen. She had joy in her heart. I remember her, she came to me one time and she said, I got chewed out this morning. And I said, why did you get chewed out? Because I was praying too loud and it upset my neighbor. Let us have a heart that shouts out. Let us have a heart that say, yes, Lord. Where God gives the oil of joy, I believe He gives us the garment of praise. Those comforts which come from God dispose the heart to and enlarge the heart in thanksgiving to God. Can, can we take just a moment? I'm not done with my sermon, but can we just take a moment and raise our hands towards the sky and just take a moment and praise Him? Just give Him praise and glory. Just worship Him. If you've got sadness in your heart, would you just exchange that for joy? If you've got mourning in your heart, if you've got depression in your heart, would you just share that with the Lord and say, Lord, would you please take that and give me just the joy of the heart this morning? Come, Lord God, right this very moment and help me, I pray, to get over these things and let my heart be full of thanksgiving to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Jesus also came, my last point this morning is to establish and to restore to establish and to restore. They will be called oaks of righteousness, a planting of the Lord for the display of His splendor. They will rebuild the ancient ruins and restore the places long devastated. They will renew the ruined cities that have been devastated for generations. Now, please hear me. Please hear my heart. God is looking for trees of righteousness. Pastor, who are the trees of righteousness? If you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, raise your hand. Trees of righteousness. Trees of righteousness. Trees of righteousness. Who believes that an army can go out and change things? An army of God's followers can go out and see things changed. Who here knows someone that desperately needs Jesus? Let me see a hand. You know someone who desperately needs Jesus? Raise a hand. Let me also ask you this. How many of you are in despair over the crime wave that is going through our land right now? In despair over the crime that's going on in our world right now? How many of you are in despair over it seems like just the influx of addiction that's taking place in the world today. Did, did you know there have been more suicide attempts over the last two years than has been recorded in a long time? I think the, the numbers I saw were 200% rise, a 200% rise in attempted suicides in the last two years. How many of you believe that there's a world of loneliness around us? A world of fear and desperation. How many of you have felt helpless at times and said, I just don't know what to do. I don't, 
I don't have an answer. I, don't, I can't comprehend how I can fix the things I see going on around me. How many of you are tired of thinking that a politician can fix things? <laughs> Who believes that Jesus came to set captives free? So, Pastor, how's he going to do that? If you're saved, raise your hand again. Let me see. If you're saved, raise your hand again. Let me see. Pastor, how's he going to do that? Trees of righteousness. Trees of righteousness. Trees of righteousness who he will use to set the world on fire, to turn the world upside down, and to see lives and change forever. You will never listen to me very clearly. You can't pack enough guns in your home to save your life. But by the blood of the Lamb, you can see salvation. You can't send people to enough treatment programs. But oh, the blood of the Lamb can set captives free. You say, Pastor, I don't know what to say. They just tell people your story. What's your story? I once was lost, but now I'm found. I once was broken, but Jesus put me back together again. I once was empty and void, but he filled me with his Holy Spirit. I once had no voice because I couldn't speak, but now I speak through the anointing of the Holy Spirit. I once was so broken and in despair, I was no good, but God came and took away my mourning and filled me with joy. And joy unspeakable and full of glory. What can we do for the world today? Let us be trees of righteousness. Let us be trees of righteousness. Let us be trees of righteousness. I know that there are those here this morning that the enemy has told you that you are damaged goods, broken and undone. But I declare to you that Jesus has come to restore you. Jesus is ready to trade in your old garment of unrighteousness and he wants to make you an oak of righteousness, a mighty spiritual tree. Those things that the devil has tried to destroy and tear down, Jesus is ready to rebuild and to establish. How many believe this morning that we need a consistent people? A consistent people, dependable people. Listen to Psalms 1.1. 1, 1. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. He will be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in its season. Its leaves will not wither, and wherever he does will, and whatever he does will prosper. Who believes that the Holy Spirit can raise up a body of Jesus Christ that will be effective and productive in the world around us today? How about you? How about you? I know I said that was my last point, but I, I told you a story. I have a couple of more. Jesus came to exalt, and you will be called priest of the Lord. You will be named ministers of your God. You will feed on the wealth of nations, and in their riches you will boast. Instead of their shame, my people will receive a double portion, and instead of disgrace, they will rejoice in their inheritance. And so they will inherit a double portion in their land, and everlasting joy will be theirs. Jesus not only will restore you, but he desires to make you successful and productive. Not in a material way today, but Jesus desires for us to be rich in winning souls for the kingdom of God. Listen to Ephesians 3.20. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly beyond all that we ask or imagine, according to the power that works where? In us. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. Who believes Jesus came to restore the lost? How many believe He's come to uplift those that are despondent? Who believes He's come to give courage to the weak? Jesus also came to make us a testimony. Their descendants will be known among the nations and their offspring among the peoples. To all who see them will acknowledge that they are a people the Lord has blessed. Do all who see you know the Lord has blessed you? I ask you very clearly, the Holy Spirit spoke to us this morning and said, Be salt and light. Be salt and light. Be salt and light. 
Are you being salt and light in the place that God has placed you? Does your walk look like your talk? When people see you, do they see Christ in you, the hope of glory? Are you proclaiming the good news to your sphere of influence? Why did Jesus come all those years ago? Why do we celebrate Christmas? Why is it that we call upon the name of Jesus? Because, my friends, He is our only hope. Didn't we sing that this morning? That He is our only hope. The hope of salvation is Christ Jesus.